Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. As Pro Professor Leff said, my name is Donna Buchanan, and I am the director of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Center, one of the primary sponsors of tonight's event. And before we begin, I'd like to remind you about the Conference on Post-Communist Nostalgia, which is being held tomorrow and on Saturday in the Illini Union, and with which tonight's lecture is connected. On behalf of the Center, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, the award-winning journalist, historian, and author, Misha Glenny, who has been working in and writing about Eastern Europe since the mid-1980s. Born in the United Kingdom, Mr. Glenny trained at Bristol University, Berlin's Free University, and at Charles University in Prague, and is a speaker of German, Czech, Croatian, and Serbian. His knowledge of the region is profound and rooted in extensive firsthand experience. During the late 1980s, Mr. Glenny covered Central and Southeastern Europe for The Guardian, moving to the BBC World Service, where he worked as the Vienna-based Central Europe correspondent during the Yugoslav conflict of the early 1990s. In 1993, he received a Sony Award for his coverage of Yugoslavia, which included seven months living and working on the war's major fronts in 1991. Since that year, he has published three of the most highly respected volumes concerning nationalism, ethnicity, politics, and conflict in the Balkans. These include The Rebirth of History, Eastern Europe in the Age of Democracy, one of the most definitive, authoritative accounts of the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, The Fall of Yugoslavia, The Third Balkan War, which won the Overseas Press Club Award for Best Book on Foreign Affairs, and more recently, The Balkans, Nationalism, War, and the Great Powers, 1804 to 1999, the writing of which was supported by the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars over a four-year period. He has lectured widely on his findings at universities throughout the United States and Europe and is a frequent commentator for media broadcasts such as the NPR program, All Things Considered. Mr. Glenny's lecture this evening, which is entitled The Spider Trap, Corruption, Organized Crime, and Transition in the Balkans and Russia, focuses on issues related to political change, transitional, transitional economics, international security, and EU enlargement. His talk is related to a new book project for which he has been conducting the field research all over the Balkans and Russia during the past two years. Specifically, he will address the tangled relationship between weak government, corrupt business, and crime as pivotal forces that drove regional conflict and prompted the emergence of capitalism in Russia and Eastern Europe between 1989 and 2003. Before closing, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to all of the campus units who, whose financial co-sponsorships made tonight's event possible. And for a list of those units, you can see the poster. There are too many for me to name here, singly. We feel very fortunate to have Mr. Glennie here and are also tremendously grateful to him for taking time out of his demanding schedule to prepare and present this lecture for us. Please join me in welcoming Misha Glennie. Uh, one thing missing from my biography was the fact that bizarrely as an 18-year-old, I ended up in Carbondale, Illinois. Um, uh, my father at the time was a visiting professor at the uh, um, Russian research center run by one Herbert Marshall, a very mercurial figure. And uh, it was a rather lonely vid vigil that my father uh, held there for um, a year, and he persuaded me as an 18-year-old to go over there and keep him company. And we used to dream about coming up to Champaign-Urbana, which we considered was the kind of, you know, center of the intellectual and social world. Um, but uh, we never made it, and I really, I had no idea that 30 years later, or whatever it is, I would finally make it. And so I'd like to thank everybody, the, Miller, the Millicom and uh, uh, Donna Buchanan and the Center for making this visit possible and seeing that the nirvana that we uh, imagined was in fact absolutely true. Uh, <coughs> anyway, so I will, I will now start. The bells tolled uninter uninterrupted for 15 minutes as the solemn figure of Patriarch Maxim, head of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, uh, 
led the coffin into St. Nadalia's Cathedral, accompanied by several thousand mourners. It seemed as if Le Tout Sophia had dropped what they were doing on that blustery cold Friday in March to pay their final respects to the man who had defined the 1990s for so many of them. At the end of the service, 30 brothers from the dear departed's Masonic Lodge, the ancient, free, and accepted Scottish custom, closed the doors of the cathedral. Dressed in jet black suits and clasping bouquets of white flowers, the men performed a secret ritual to speed Brother Pavlov to the eternal Orient. His overall gloves and the lodge's crest then accompanied Brother Pavlov to the grand architect of the universe. The government was, representative, was represented by the Minister of State Administration, but he bore a precious message from the Prime Minister Simeon Saksko-Burski. Formerly the King of Bulgaria, the lean and elegant Simeon had relinquished his claim to the throne in order to lead his country and its government out of the morass of the late 1990s following his party's landslide victory in the elections of 2000. We shall remember Ilya Pavlov read the King's telegram of condolence because he created jobs for many families in a difficult period for the people. We'll remember him for his spirit as a businessman and for his extraordinary energy. MPs, artists, the bosses of the most important oil companies and banks, two former Miss Bulgarias, the entire Levski soccer team, to Bulgarians a fusion of Manchester United and the Yankees, they all joined Pavlov's grieving family. Anyone who was anything in Bulgaria was there, including another prominent group of his acquaintances, better known to the Bulgarian public by their nicknames, the Skull, the Beak, Dimi the Russian, and the Doctor. The most conspicuous absentee was the American ambassador to uh, Bulgaria, Jim Pardieu. The embassy had, of course, made urgent inquiries a week earlier when a single sniper bullet felled Ilya Pavlov at a quarter to eight in the evening as he stood outside the headquarters of his megacorporation, Multigroup. After all, the death of such an eminent and wealthy American citizen on foreign soil would naturally raise serious concerns for the U.S. and its representatives. To be sure, Pavlov could never have made it to the White House as he was not born in America but he was still a proud foot soldier in that mighty army that has participated in the rich traditions of naturalized immigration to the United States. The only curious aspect about Pavlov's American aspirations was that two consecutive US ambassadors to Sofia vigorously opposed them. Both diplomats made personal representations in Washington to try and prevent Pavlov entering the country, let alone having US citizenship bestowed upon him. But one thing Pavlov, nor several of his colleagues and competitors around the world ever lacked was ambition. And the immense shift in global economics and politics that occurred in the late 1980s offered them new paths and golden opportunities to realize that ambition. Their efforts and achievements had testify, among other things, to the inability of the Western world to identify and map these paths, let alone do anything to block them. Indeed, the manner of Pavlov's death was the ultimate proof that the greatest threat to him, his interests, and his associates stemmed not from Interpol or the FBI, but from his peers. Almost in passing, this new type of global businessman also exposed the hopelessness and corruptibility of American and European security arrangements, not only before 9-11, but after 9-11 as well. As a teenager growing up in the 1970s, young Ilya Pavlov had one particular skill which marked him out from most of his peers. He was an accomplished wrestler, indeed the champion of Bulgaria in his weight class. Had he been very smart or a gifted rock guitarist, Ilya might have landed in trouble, as these talents usually led youngsters to a life of rebellion and disobedience. But being a successful sportsman or woman was the key to privilege. Moreover, in Bulgaria, the greatest heroes were not soccer or tennis players, but muscle men. Before the fall of communism, weightlifting, wrestling, boxing, and other such sports were dominated by Eastern Bloc states, which routinely pumped their promising fighters with gallons of steroids in the search for Olympic glory. A pro in all but name, the successful wrestler could expect public acclamation and, of course, derivative benefits such as casual sex on tap, money, an apartment, and a car, the latter being out of reach of all but the most fated youngsters. 
Pavlov would have anticipated this when he was picked out to attend the Institute for Physical Culture in Sofia, Bulgaria's elite breeding ground for future Olympians. And Ilya was doubly advantaged because his father ran a restaurant and bar in Sofia, where his tough young son worked. At that time, being a barman or waiter confirmed, con conferred considerable social status on you, explained Emil Kulev, one of his contemporaries at the Institute. He hung out with a lot of tough guys and people looked up to him. That way, he also came into contact with the security services. For an uneducated young steer like Pavlov, the DS, or the state security, was not the Orwellian instrument of repression that people in the West perceived. State security was a happening institution through which one could build status and influence. If, as many claim, Pavlov worked as an informant for the DS, then he could expect rewards. His most important came in the shape of a pretty young woman, Tony Chergalanova, who accepted his proposal of marriage in 1982. A greater catch than the girl was her father, Petr Chergolanov, who worked for state security. Ilya had wed into secret police royalty. The Bulgarian state security service was held in special regard by its Soviet masters for its efficacy and reliability. Usually invisible, it never disappointed on those occasions when it did catch the public eye. The DS masterminded the death of a Bulgarian dissident who, when working for the BBC in London, was struck down by a poison-tipped umbrella as he strode across Waterloo Bridge in 1978. But the business of eliminating enemies of the state la carre style was mere icing on the cake. The most important and lucrative trade of the Bulgarian Secret Service was smuggling in drugs, in arms, and in high tech. Smuggling is our cultural heritage, Ivan Krastev, Bulgaria's leading political scientist, explained. Our territory has always nestled between huge ideologies, between orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, between Islam and Christianity, between capitalism and communism. Empires riddled with hostility and suspicion for one another, but home nonetheless to many people who want to trade across the prohibited boundaries. In the Balkans, we know how to make those boundaries disappear. We can cross the roughest sea and traverse the most forbidding mountain. We know every secret pass, and failing that, the price of every border guard. In communist Bulgaria, this romantic tradition fused with the might of the totalitarian state, and the DS took full advantage. As early as the 1960s, it established a company called Kintex, which enjoyed a monopoly on the export of arms from Bulgaria and sought out markets in trouble spots like the Middle East and Africa. At the end of the 1970s, the DS expanded Kintex by setting up the Covert Transit Directorate. Its primary role was to smuggle weapons to African insurgent groups, but soon the channels were also being used for illegal people trafficking, for drugs, and even for the smuggling of works of art and antiquities. The DS was happy to see Bulgaria play a pivotal role in the distribution of illicit goods and services between Europe, the Middle East, and Central Asia. But it was resolute in preventing anyone else from muscling in on the trade. Bulgarian border regimes were ruthless and severe punishments were meted out to anybody caught smuggling drugs, drugs or weapons without authorization. This resolve was not born of a commitment to uphold the rule of law, a concept that was anathema to the security service, but to underscore the DS's economic monopoly. At the heart of all three smuggling operations lay military counterintelligence, the second directorate of the DS. This was not only because all three industries, drugs, arms, and high tech, were deemed of immense strategic value to the Bulgarian state. The second directorate controlled all of Bulgaria's borders, an anomaly that lasted until 1997, long after it should have been dismantled. And the head of military counterintelligence was General Petr Chergolanov, the father-in-law to Ilya Pavlov. In 1986, as Mikhail Gorbachev consolidated his authority in Moscow, Western leaders were confidently predicting that the Soviet Union and its East European allies would last at least another two decades. The Bulgarian State Security Service had no such illusions about the system it policed. An experienced observer of the Soviet scene, the DS's leadership calculated that the game was up and communism did not have long to last. And so the top secret policemen were busy preparing to embrace capitalism. Under pressure from Gorbachev, the Bulgarian Communist Party had passed Decree 56, 
which overnight allowed the creation of private companies in Bulgaria. The party still contained many hardliners who were shocked by this development, but the security services, which habitually subordinated ideology to the love of power, took it in their stride. I started looking at the trade register for 1986, and then it struck me, explained Stanimir Vaglenov, a Bulgarian journalist who specializes in corruption and organized crime. The security services founded the first company a week after Decree 56 came into effect, and within the first year, members of the DS had founded 90% of the new joint stock companies. While the bulk of Bulgaria's long-suffering population was still being force-fed the rhetorical garbage about socialism's bright and eternal future, the regime's most senior representatives were teaching themselves how to make money, big money. Having spent 45 years expounding the theoretical evils of capitalism to ordinary Bulgarians, the secret police were now intent on demonstrating those evils in practice. <laughs> Ilya Pavlov, Pavlov was well positioned amongst these people, and before long he was permitted to register MultiArt, a company dedicated to the import and export of antiques and high art, using the channels established by Kindex's covert, direct, covert directorate. Business flourished, and before long, Pavlov had become the talk of the town, bursting into one of the new private restaurants with a team of stunning young women swinging behind him. The lizard had acquired a tail. Multi-art was in fact a big mess, Pavlov later conceded in describing his early days. We developed a whole string of businesses without any structure. Now, one of Multi-art's co-directors was Dmitry Ivanov, boss of the sixth directorate of the DS known with mock affection in Bulgaria as the Gestapo. Ivanov introduced Ilya to Andrei Lukanov, the country's leading reform communist. From being a champion wrestler, all-round toughy, and glitzy pimp, Ilya Pavlov had met a group of guys with whom he was going to get very, very rich and very corrupt. Andrei Lukanov beamed mischievously as we surveyed the chaotic parliamentary proceedings in the last days of 1989. This is all going rather well, don't you think? I was perplexed. But aren't you worried about ordinary people's reaction towards communists like you, I asked him. Oh, no, Misha, you mustn't be alarmist, he retorted in impeccable English. I have always wanted to change, and things are about to get much better. <laughs> Despite his slightly gnomish face, Lukanov was charm personified, in stark contrast to most other influential communists. People, including me, took an instant liking to him. A polyglot with the smoothest political patter, Lukanov was born in Moscow, where he maintained a dense web of connections. He had assumed the role of prime minister after the overthrow of the dictator Todor Zhivkov in November 1989, and together with Ilya Pavlov and their friends in the DS, he was planning to hijack the Bulgarian economy. They had all their bases covered. Lukanov controlled the political machine. Dmitry Ivanov mobilized the security services network. Ilya and his wrestler friends provided the muscle. The only thing missing was support from the democratic opposition. But this would be difficult because the newly formed Union of Democratic Forces with unstinting financial and political support from the American embassy was bitterly hostile to the communists for the destruction they had wrought on the country. Ilya came up with a solution. He was friends with the deputy head of Podkrepa, Bulgaria's fiercely anti-communist independent trades union, which also received strong backing from the American government. Adopting his regular Joe persona, Pavlov persuaded Podkrepa's bosses that the real enemies of ordinary workers were the communist-appointed directors of the big state-owned factories. Ilya's game was simple, Boyko Borisov, speaks with authority in his mid-40s, the clean-cut general inspector of the interior minister, uh, ministry as was, and now the mayor of Sofia, is a black belt in karate. He also used to be involved in protection rackets before going straight and joining Prime Minister Saksko-Burski as his bodyguard. The quintessential poacher-turned-gamekeeper, he has inside knowledge of the criminalization of Bulgaria. It was called the spider trap, he said, Ilya walked into the office of the director of, say, the biggest steelworks in Eastern Europe. He is accompanied by a boss of the most powerful trades union. And then sitting there is Dmitry Ivanov, the man who until recently was head of the sixth directorate. And these guys tell the director of the enterprise, you have a choice. Work with us or we will simply destroy you. 
Pavlov told the director that from now on he would be buying raw materials not directly from the Russians at a subsidized price, but from one of his, Pavlov's companies, at the world market price. And then instead of selling the end product directly to the consumer, the director would have to sell it at a knockdown price to another of Ilya's firms, which would then sell it on the open market. He controlled the entrance and the exit to the factory. This was what was known as the spider trap. Pavlov was astonished and delighted by the simplicity and efficacy of the system. The government, run by Lukanov, one of his accomplices, continued to provide subsidies to the companies over many years. The enterprise doesn't collapse immediately, said Emil Kulev, once a swimmer, and until recently, before he was gunned down on the streets of Sofia, one of Bulgaria's richest bankers. You hang a goat on a hook and cut it at its foot, and it will expire very slowly as the blood leaves its body, drop by drop. It agonizes over the years. Pavlov and friends created these holding companies in virtually every branch of the Bulgarian economy, in agriculture, in transport, in industry, energy, you name it. The holdings were parallel to the branch organizations of Podkrepa. Wherever Podkrepa was, Ilya would create a holding company. After the revolution of 1989, Bulgaria's social security system collapsed, leaving a trail of poverty and destitution in its wake. Pavlov, however, quickly became a multimillionaire and on his way to becoming a billionaire by transferring the assets of the state into his private liquid capital. The headquarters of Multigroup, his new corporation, was located in the mansion on Bistritsa Mountain outside Sofia, where Bulgaria's top trade unionists had once spent their holidays. The building had been bought for a song by Robert Maxwell, the British media magnate who had been cultivating both the Soviet and Bulgarian communists for several years. Together with Lukanov, Maxwell had arranged the transfer of $2 billion from Bulgaria into Western tax havens. Subsequent Bulgarian governments were unable to trace what happened to this cash, although we do know that it did not end up in the London Daily Mirror's pension fund, from which Maxwell was also stealing hundreds of millions of pounds at the time. Still in his early 30s, Pavlov was the most influential businessman in Bulgaria, and he was soon able to create a sister company in Vienna, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. It was through Multigroup U.S. that he bought two casinos in Paraguay, although there is no evidence that he invested any money here itself. Back in Bulgaria, Pavlov had employed several PR firms to project an image of dynamic success and patriotism. He became the face of the new Bulgaria. Newspapers and TV shows followed his exploits, usually quite lavishly. Invitations to social events like his birthday party on August the 6th, traditionally held at one of the most opulent hotels in the Black Sea Resort of Varna, became prized possessions, as recipients had the opportunity to mix with the grandest members of the country's economic and political elite. Just to have your photo taken with Ilya was enough to secure large loans on easy terms. At first hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands of Bulgarians desperate for money and employment became dependent on multi-group and its affiliates' commercial operations. Naturally, many disproved of Pavlov's methods. Many others were jealous competitors who conspired with and against him in the demimonde of Bulgaria's nascent market economy, where it was usually impossible to distinguish between the legal, the grey, and the outright criminal. But others regarded him as a genuine, energetic, and likable entrepreneur with the interests of Bulgaria at heart, providing jobs in areas where the state had unexpectedly and calamitously fulfilled Marx's prophecy by withering away. Bulgaria had been hit hard as it emerged from the cave-dwelling existence of socialist economics into the blinding sun of free market capitalism. Traditionally an agricultural country, it had undergone extensive industrialization under the communists. At the time, it was able to develop its heavy industry in this rather artificial manner because the socialist trading bloc ensured its products had a guarantee sale in the Soviet Union and other East European countries. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, Bulgaria's markets crumbled with them. The European Union was unwilling to increase its minuscule imports of Bulgarian agricultural produce as this would undermine its protectionist racket masquerading grandly as the common agricultural policy. The United States operates a similar scheme, the farm subsidies regime.
As the world's major powers began to trumpet the revolutionary significance of globalization in the early 1990s, they skimmed over its inconsistencies. When countries opened up in the hope of greater cooperation with the mighty Western economies, the EU, the US, and Japan, these three demanded that the, <clears throat> these emerging markets accept the sale of European, American, and Japanese goods, while also permitting the repatriation of profits resulting from any investment. Within months of the end of communism, Snickers, Nike, Swatch, Heineken, and Mercedes had begun their irresistible march eastwards, conquering in a matter of weeks those parts of Europe that had defied even Napoleon and Hitler. Entranced by the novelty and quality of these must-have Western goods, the peoples of Eastern Europe and Africa and Asia, for that matter, dug deep to spend what little money they possessed to acquire the new status symbols. It is a universally acknowledged truth of international trade that if you import goods and services into your country, you need to export others in order to pay for them. The poorer the country, the more urgent the need. It's much cheaper for rich countries like the United States to run up ludicrous debts. This is where Bulgaria's high-quality soft fruits, cotton, roses, wines, and cereals have, could have played a vital role in restoring this battled, battered little economy. Such goods could perhaps have offset some of the cost of the new Western products flooding the market. Unfortunately, the opportunities were severely limited by arrangements like the Common Agricultural Policy blocking the sale of produce. Bulgarian consumer goods were still socialist in design and durability, i.e. they were ugly and they did not work, and therefore there were no competition for Western consumer products. And so this was Bulgaria in 1990. The country had lost its markets, Pavlov and friends were skimming the economy of all its valuables, nobody wanted to buy Bulgarian goods, and furthermore, the state had to pay off $10 billion worth of debt. What could they possibly sell to finance the modest lifestyle of the overwhelming majority of the population? When the communist regime was overthrown in November 1989, ironically, the revolution was led by communists like Lukanov, now impatient to begin their capitalist careers, many Bulgarians were understandably keen to see the great machine of communist repression dismantled. In an equally understandable bid to win popularity, successive governments started sacking thousands upon thousands of policemen. All manner of operatives lost their jobs. <clears throat> Secret police, counterintelligence officers, special forces commandos, border guards, as well as homicide detectives and traffic cops. Their skills included surveillance, smuggling, killing people, establishing networks, and blackmail. By 1991, 14,000 secret policemen were kicking their heels and looking for work in a country where the economy was contracting at an alarming rate. One sector, however, was experiencing, experiencing an unprecedented expansion, and it was a line of work that was ideally suited to unemployed and disaffected policemen. This sector was organized crime. It was a bright, warm spring day as I pulled up in front of the Hotel Esplanade on Gaeva Street in central Zagreb. The four-hour drive from Vienna had been a breeze in my black Audi Quattro, care of the BBC, and I handed over the keys to the porter so he could valet park the car. The Esplanade was one of the few compensations of covering the wars in Yugoslavia. The service was over the top in an endearingly silly Central European manner, and its staff maintained a sense of humor in the face of ever more depressing news about violent clashes between Serb and Croatian militiamen. Everyone swung in and out of the Esplanade, mediators like Cyrus Vance and Lord David Owen, and various ministers from the region, from the EU, and from the United States. They would dine next to mercenaries who were filling the rooms in anticipation of a profitable war, or young diaspora Croats from Edmonton or Cleveland, Ohio, who were ready to risk their lives for a fatherland they had never before clapped eyes on. The morning after my arrival, I gathered my BBC recording equipment and went to find the Audi in the car park. It wasn't there. <laughs> I didn't yet know it, but my car had embarked on a mystery tour which would end several weeks later at a used car market 200 miles away in Mostar, the capital of Western Herzegovina. By then, mercifully, I had collected the insurance. Fortunately, the, Australia, the Austrian insurance companies had not yet scrapped cover for Yugoslavia, although they had already done so for Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and Albania. 
And so I never saw my dear Audi again, which would almost certainly have then been commandeered by one of the emerging militias in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thus did I fall victim to Europe's fastest growing industry, car theft. Every month, thousands of cars would be stolen for their, uh, from the streets of Northern Europe in preparation for their illegal export to Eastern Europe and the Balkans. In 1992, I watched a huge container ship regurgitate the contents of its hold into the decrepit Albanian port of Dures, onto a quay of chipped stone and rust rolled dozens of BMWs, Peugeots, Hondas, and above all, Mercedes, Mercedes, and more Mercedes mostly the 200 series beloved of taxi drivers in Germany, the Low Countries, and Scandinavia. Customs officers barely awoke from their slumber as excited, dusty, and dirty men took possession of vehicles still with their original number plates, with their anti-odor Christmas trees and family photos dangling from the mirror with old cigarette packets on the seats. Cars were banned in communist Albania except for official use, the roads were designed to accommodate a few trucks a day, while nobody except the small band of state chauffeurs learned how to drive. In the chaos of collapsing communism, the floodgates opened, and anyone able to get their hands on a stolen car hit the public highways with a Mediterranean gusto, despite never having sat behind a wheel. Mayhem. The country was transformed into a huge and deadly dodgem ride, while any vehicle was fair game for thieves. Given that they were all stolen anyhow, it was difficult to construct a, moral, construct a morally watertight case of ownership. The cars that didn't stay in Albania were sold on in Macedonia, Bulgaria, Russia, the Middle East, the Caucasus, and the former Soviet Central Asia. In Bulgaria, the distribution network for the stolen cars belonged to the wrestlers. Across the country, this tight band of comrades took control of motels along the major transit routes. With their superior muscle and high level of trust among themselves, they embarked on a violent spree of both intimidation and incorporation of petty thieves and street gangs. By 1992, the wrestlers enjoyed a near stranglehold on Bulgaria's major cities, although in some areas they faced competition from protection rackets run by ex-policemen and security officers. The two most powerful organizations, <clears throat> known by the acronym SIC and VIS, employed both former sportsmen and police. SIC, VIS, and later the uh, Aravist Tim became huge operations, and it often seemed as though these people and not the government was in charge of the country. We are not just talking about these thick necks with gold chains taking the best seats in one's favorite restaurant, exploded one European diplomat unable to contain his disgust. They had the cheek and the confidence to block off entire thoroughfares in the center of Sofia just because they wished to lunch undisturbed by the traffic. Later on, Ilya Pavlov was careful not to associate himself too closely with any of these groups. But earlier, he was close friends with several of the most prominent gangsters. Most notably, he worked with one of six bosses, Mladen Mihailov, known to all as Majo, not, because Majo at least, not least because Majo started his career as Ilya's chauffeur. To blame Ilya Pavlov for choosing this life, which veered between gross corruption, grand larceny, and organized crime, would be unfair. He was not an especially moral person, but he took his opportunity at a time when the Bulgarian state had all but collapsed. People were discovering all over Eastern Europe that when the country goes into free fall, the law is the first thing which is crushed under the rubble of transformation. Capitalism had not existed until 1989, and so the hopelessly weak states that emerged throughout the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe had simply no capacity to define what was legal and what was illegal. They had neither the money nor the experience to police the novelty of commercial exchange. And so those who positioned themselves well in the first three years after the end of communism were often in a position to make up the rules of their brave new world as they went along. Then, and not for the last time, the West did something really, really dumb. On May the 30th, 1992, the United Nations Secretary Council in, uh, Security Council in New York passed Resolution 754, which imposed full economic sanctions, barring for registered foodstuffs and medicines, on the rump Yugoslavia, consisting of Serbia, including Kosovo and Montenegro. Now, more than in any other former communist country, politics and organized crime were tangled in a tight knot throughout the former Yugoslavia. It affected dictators, opposition politicians, 
liberals, nationalists, and Democrats alike. In public, the criminal bosses from the various republics were denouncing their national enemies as demons bent on genocide and extermination. But in private, the Croat, Bosniak, Albanian, Macedonian, and Serb moneymen and mobsters were truly as thick as thieves. They bought, sold, and exchanged all manner of commodities, knowing that the high levels of personal trust between them were much stronger than the transitory bonds of hysterical nationalism which they fomented among ordinary folk to cover their own venality. As one commentator described it when talking about Serbia, the new republics were ruled, quote, by a parastate cartel which had emerged from political institutions, the ruling Communist Party and its satellites, the military, a variety of police forces, the mafia, court intellectuals, and with the president of the republic, Ayim Milosevic, at the center of this spider web. Tribal nationalism was indispensable for the cartel as a means to pacify its subordinates and as cover for the uninterrupted privatization of the state apparatus." Unquote. As a consequence of war, sanctions, and corruption in the Balkans during the first half of the 1990s, the states of the former Yugoslavia turned to and nurtured mafias to run the logistics of their military effort. And it was not long before the criminals were in control of the economy, the government, and the war. Anyone with serious political ambition, ambition had no choice but to get mobbed up. In their wars for independence, the Croats and Bosniaks faced one huge challenge. Yugoslavia boasted the JNA, the fourth biggest army in the world, which in turn possessed a sizable, if aging, arsenal. The great majority of Croat and Bosniak officers in the JNA went over to their local governments to fight for secession, but they desperately needed weapons. This became all the more urgent when the UN imposed an arms embargo on all the Yugoslav republics three months after the fighting broke out in June 1991. In order to stand a chance of winning the war, first Croatia and then a year later Bosnia had to find ways of importing weapons despite the international ban. The arms embargo played a key role in establishing the smuggling channels to Croatia and Bosnia and soon drugs were accompanying the guns along the same routes. But this was nothing compared to the Balkan-wide impact which the comprehensive UN economic sanctions imposed on the rump Yugoslavia, comprising Serbia, as I said, Kosovo, and Montenegro. Where the Croats and Bosnians were short of guns, the Serbs badly needed oil. And just as Serbia allowed weapons from Romania and Bulgaria and Ukraine to reach their enemies in Croatia and Bosnia via Serbian territory, so were the Bosnians, Croats, and Albanians more than happy to sell oil to their Serbian enemies because of the extraordinary profits that a sanctions regime generates. The embargo's impact on Western economies was negligible. Most Western companies could afford to stop trading with Belgrade, especially as their governments issued strict warning about compliance. But Bulgarian businessmen like Ilya Pavlov felt less constrained. Borrowing rail cars from the government, Pavlov sent millions of gallons of petrol into Serbia by train. They were accompanied by members of the sick protection racket and waved through by customs officers whose measly pay packets meant that their allegiance was easily purchased. <clears throat> the Romanians floated barges, almost sinking under the weight of their appallingly low-grade oil. One of the largest operations was the permanent flotilla of rafts drifting across Lake Škodra from Albania and into Montenegro, part of the sanctions-busting carnival which was caught on camera by the CIA. This was also, of course, an opportunity that Russian business could not let slip, let slip through its fingers. Gazprom holds a monopoly on the distribution to Western Europe of Russia's and Central Asia's vast gas reserves. That makes it one of the world's most powerful companies, and it also has always had an eye for a quick, profitable deal. Using its surplus grain stocks, Serbia was able to barter between 100 to 250 million dollars of oil a year from Gazprom, and as no hard currency transactions were involved, there was no danger of the deal being scuppered by the international financial watchdogs, who were in any case impotent. By the time the petrol reached the consumer in Belgrade, it was four times the price of fuel elsewhere in Europe. I would buy it by the side of the road in the district of Zemun. Petty traders sat on their jerry cans and buckets full of petrol, lit cigarettes hanging out of the mouth as a matter of course. <laughs> Vehicles just pulled up beside them and the driver purchased two or three gallons of whatever was available. 
The Balkan government paid lip service to the sanctions, insisting that they were helpless to stop the organized crime syndicates that were behind this mass violation of the embargo. This was certainly true. They were helpless, but they had no choice in the matter. It was even worse. They had to participate and encourage this criminalization of regional trade in order to survive. Serbia is at the very center of Balkan trading routes and is one of the biggest regional markets. For the rest of the Balkans, respecting the sanctions would have meant financial suicide. Not a penny of assistance or compensation was offered to Yugoslavia's neighboring states. They were all expected to shoulder the costs of the international community's moral indignation. So the only way they could pay pensions, wages, and health care was by allowing the mob to shore up its control of the country's main trading routes and claim ignorance, helplessness, or both. As the crisis deepened, so did this damaging symbiotic relationship between politics and crime. The economies of the fragmented republics of the former Yugoslavia had been devastated. Firms were often dependent on suppliers in countries they were now at war with. The export of industrial products to Eastern and Western Europe had collapsed, but they were still purchasing billions of dollars of weapons, oil, food, consumer goods, and luxury goods every month. Although the majority of the population was becoming poorer by the day, a hugely wealthy new class of entrepreneurs and gangsters were visible on the streets of all Balkan cities. Ferraris, Porsches, armored Mercedes and SUVs clogged up Zagreb, Belgrade and elsewhere. Their drivers and passengers carried guns with impunity and would sport the nationalist insignia of their particular tribe, because although they were quite happy to trade with their equivalents in enemy territories, most were hooked up with the vile militias that were busy slaughtering civilian populations in the war zones of Bosnia and Croatia. Somehow, this orgy of war and consumer excess had to be paid for. The former Yugoslav republics were no longer in a position to balance the books with their traditional exports, and so they decided to finance the war by other means. And because the industry of sanctions busting had now created a huge pan-Balkan network of organized crime whose members had no sense of ethnic loyalty when it came to trade, the easiest way of underwriting the affairs of state was through mafia business, cigarettes, drugs, women, and migrants. The foundations for a factory of crime had been laid. Now, in the pulsing heart, pulsating heartlands of mafia activity, the Balkans, Russia, Hong Kong, Nigeria, Colombia, Mexico, southern Italy, mortality rates in and around the business are strikingly high. The statistics are grim but clear. Most of the murdered are male aged between 20 and 45. So although a career in organized crime in these regions offers a very attractive lifestyle, it is often short-lived. In the Balkans, there have been numerous assassinations of the most powerful mob and oligarchy leaders and their closest associates. Ilya Pavlov was murdered in Sofia just a week before the Serbian Prime Minister Zoran Djindjic was gunned down in Belgrade. After becoming Prime Minister in late 2000, Djindjic was determined to do something about criminal activity, but it is no secret that he too was involved with one of the seemiest gangs in Serbia, the Surchin clan. The nexus of party politics and crime is absolutely key, observed Bill Montgomery, who had been ambassador to Zagreb, Sofia, and to Belgrade. In order to survive under Milosevic, opposition parties had to have financial support, and a thoughtful criminal would invest in political parties for the future. So the violent impact of the turf wars fought by the mafia groups was multiplied by their varied political allegiance. All manner of commodities were traded across the Balkans and into the European Union. Situated just below and across from the soft underbelly of the EU, the Balkan Peninsula has developed into the ideal transit zone for illicit goods and services from around the world, seeking access to the most affluent consumer market in history. In May 2004, the EU expanded to include 10 new countries, whose population now totals some 400 million. By dint of their unprecedented spending power, these people now belong to the most fantastic market history has ever seen. They can choose from a glittering array of consumer goods to ease their lifestyle and fill their leisure time. Despite this wealth of choice, a significant section, including both rich and poor, has sought to satisfy its needs outside the legitimate market. To be blunt, 
Organized crime in the Balkans is such a rewarding industry because ordinary West Europeans spend an ever burgeoning amount of their spare time and money sleeping with prostitutes, smoking untaxed cigarettes, sticking 50 euro notes up their noses, or breaking skin with needle, employing illegal untaxed immigrant labor on subsistence wages, or eating the cockles and strawberries they collect, stuffing their gullets with caviar, admiring ivory and sitting on teak, or purchasing the liver and kidneys of the desperately poor in the developing world to compensate for the lifetime of excess that has so damaged their own bodily organs. And so long before Yugoslavia crashed, both the Swiss police and Interpol identified that Kosovar Albanians had created a monopoly over the narcotics trade in Zurich. Perhaps surprisingly, Switzerland, and Zurich in particular, has one of the largest drug subcultures in the Western world. Zurich even carries the unfortunate tag of Europe's HIV capital, <clears throat> largely a consequence of intravenous drug use. Most of, this heroin, most of this is heroin that has passed through Turkey, Bulgaria, and Macedonia before reaching its core distributors in Kosovo and in Serbia. The relationship between conflict and mafia is, conflict, is complex and profound. The self-appointed Kosovo government in exile used the drugs money to fund the Kosovo Liberation Army, the core of militant Albanians that began life as a tin pot organization in 1996, but with the encouragement of the United States and some Europeans developed into a useful fighting unit, dependent, it must be said, on NATO to provide its air force. Just as Western policymakers turned a blind eye to the cigarette smuggling activities of the Montenegrins while they were bat battling Milosevic, so too did they eventually engage in a temporary military alliance with a guerrilla army that was in large part financed by the heroin trade. Since that war ended in 1999, the United Nations and the European Union have been responsible for overseeing the economy of Kosovo, a territory which continues to drift in weird constitutional limbo, still part of, a Ser of Serbia but administered by the international community as a protectorate. Since the turn of the millennium, the UN civil servants running Kosovo have achieved the unique distinction of fashioning the only economy in Europe that is registering negative growth every year. Youth unemployment has been running at 70% a year for half a decade, and 40,000 eager youngsters enter a non-existent job market annually. These statistics go a long way to explaining why the mafia, which matured during the emergence of the KLA, still largely runs the real economy of the province. Of the province. And if it did not, then there would be nothing to stop the triggering of a social explosion. Unless the related problems of economic decline, constitutional uncertainty, and international incompetence are tackled, then the only institution capable of functioning will be the organized criminal syndicate. From 1991 to 1995, the Russian state was also reeling from the speed and depth of change following the collapse of communism. In that first year, President Yeltsin's team of enthusiastic reformers were gagging to introduce capitalism overnight, and Yeltsin obliged. The pilots of Yeltsin's self-styled kamikaze cabinet were two young economists, Yegor Gaidar and Anatoly Chubais. Guided by the watchword deregulate, they flew their planes into the engine room of the Soviet social contract that had ensured a stable, if grim, yet course for 70 years. We dismantled everything, explained Oleg Davidov, a key official at the Ministry of Trade. We began liberalization in the absence of any controls. For some, this was an attractive theoretical idea, but in practice, the policies contained a number of catastrophic anomalies. The prices which mattered to millions of ordinary Russians, i.e. bread and rents, were liberalized, administrating the most concentrated impact of shock therapy. In contrast, those prices which mattered to a tiny enterprising minority were not. In what Gaida once referred to with gentle understatement as a mistake, the reform team inexplicably, inexplicably held down the prices of Russia's vast natural resources, oil, gas, diamonds, and metals. At the same time, the government agreed to privatize the state monopoly that the Soviet Union had imposed on the import and export of all goods and commodities. This compelled foreign companies to conduct their business with the foreign trade ministry in Moscow as intermediary. When it came to settling the contract, they did not deal directly with the individual enterprises who were buying or selling. 
by exploiting the discrepancy between the high cost of raw materials on world markets on the one hand and their low domestic prices on the other, this regime ensured that huge foreign currency earnings afforded some compensation for the witless inefficiencies of the five-year plan. One of the few things about the Soviet Union that actually worked, the foreign trade monopoly was a supporting wall of the economy. Remove it without first installing a replacement and the house collapses. The kamikaze cabinet removed it. The coupling of a privatized foreign trade mechanism with the retention of rock-bottom commodity prices gave birth within months to an entirely new species of robber baron, the Russian oligarch. <clears throat> the logic of this life form is simple. Buy Siberian oil in sufficient quantities for $1 a barrel and sell it for $30 in the Baltic states, and before long, you become a very, very rich citizen. Within a matter of four years, a group of several hundred fabulously rich men and women had evolved, while an inner clique of mega-billionaires formed a cerebellum that exercised, exercised ever more decisive political influence over President Yeltsin. Between the oligarchs and tens of millions who had fallen into penury stood a small, fragile, and exasperated middle class. This was patently unjust and manifestly unstable. This process of en enrichment was quite simply the grandest larceny in history. As the new Russia dressed itself up to look like a responsible capitalist economy attractive to foreign investment, its most powerful capitalists were raiding its key commodities, trading these for dollars, and then exporting these funds out of the country in the biggest single flight of capital the world has ever seen. Because of the almost incalculable value of, uh, because of the almost incalculable value of these mineral resources on the global markets, this process stands no historical comparison. As the IMF shoveled billions into Russia to stabilize the economy and prop up the ruble, the oligarchs sent even larger sums to obscure banks in every corner of the world from Switzerland to the Pacific island of Nauru to be swallowed almost immediately in bafflingly complex money laundering systems. The whole process was dramatic testimony to how venality and myopic stupidity are always like to likely to triumph in the absence of regulatory institutions. The Soviet bureaucrats who still administered the state <coughs> did not understand how to monitor, regulate, or adjudicate the principles of commercial exchange. The result, quote, was that for all practical purposes, the law enforcement agencies themselves abandoned their task of safeguarding private commercial structures, as Olga Kristanovskaya, the leading sociologist of the new Russia, explained. The police and even the KGB were clueless as to how one might enforce contract law. The protection rackets and mafiosi were not. Their central role in the new Russian economy was to ensure that contracts entered into were honored. They were the new law enforcement agencies, and the oligarchs needed their services just as they needed remuneration from the oligarchs in return. And because the state's legal system had all but collapsed, it also meant that the mafia groups defined the judicial parameters of the new Russia. Between 1991 and 1996, the Russian state effectively absented itself from the policing of society. In any event, there were no hard and fast definitions of organized crime, money laundering, or extortion, and by implication, all commercial transactions were illegal and legal at the same time. And this applied as much to drugs and women as it did to cars, cigarettes, and oil. There were three fundamental differences between the protection rackets that emerged through Russia and the former Soviet Union in the 1990s and the classic mob families of southern Italy or in a more sophisticated form in New York and Chicago. A, they were indispensable for the transition from socialism to capitalism. The Russian mob played a critical role in ensuring a degree of stability during the economic transition. Of course, by normal standards, extortion, kidnapping, and murder might be perceived as a rather harsh policing regime, although West European law argues that the death penalty plays a similar role. And most people would probably find it hard to approve of car theft, narcotics, or sex trafficking, as a legitimate business enterprise. Yet Russia was not in a normal situation. No societies are free from organized crime except for severely repressive ones, and while North Korea has undoubtedly very low levels of organized crime, its state budget is decisively dependent on the trading of narcotics. 
to organize crime figures in the neighboring countries. But when you replace one set of rules, planned economy, with another free market in a country as large as Russia, with as many mineral resources as, uh, as Russia has, and at a time of epochal shifts in the global economy, then such immense change is bound to offer opportunities to economic actors, oligarchs or organized criminals, bureaucrats whose power is suddenly detached from state control, who were hitherto absent. The relative strength of organized crime in the shadow economy depended on a combination of factors. Domestic policies, initially high levels of Western approval of radical economic change, the inability of the Soviet state to adapt et al. By the mid-1990s, the Russian government estimated that between 40 to 50% of its economy was in the gray or black sectors. And it is within this context that Russia and the outside world needs to understand the phenomenon of organized crime. It emerged out of a chaotic situation and was brutal, but in its origins, lie, it lies in a rational response to a highly unusual economic and social environment. The second point is that members of the gangs, the differentiation between the classic uh, mafia units. Members of the gangs were not bound by family loyalties. The codes of the thieves' world, which conferred honor and recognition on the dons of the Russian mafia, the vori, or the thieves, only survived a matter of months in Russia's primitive capitalism. Before long, the title of Vorov Zakonya, thief-in-law, the mafia don in Russia, was up for sale. Instead of earning it after many years in prison, you could simply buy it. This devalued the authority of the Vor and the strict hierarchy of thieves that had pertained in Soviet prisons crumbled in the face of street gangs and operational criminal networks. One of the most violent and feared groups to emerge in Moscow and elsewhere was the Chechen Mafia. Their mere reputation for being both fearless and gruesome was often sufficient to cow an, cow an opponent, a, opponent or persuade a businessman to take them on as his krisha or roof protection racket but their members were not drawn exclusively from the Caucasus, let alone from Chechnya. The Chechen Mafia, who should not be confused with the guerrillas fighting in the Chechen War, became a brand name, a franchise, McMafia, if you like, explained Mark Galliotti, who has devoted the last 15 years to, discuss it, to studying the Russian mob. They would sell the moniker Chechen to protection rackets in other towns, provided those other rackets paid, of course, and provided they always carried out their work. If a group claimed a Chechen connection but didn't carry out its threats to the letter, it was devaluing the brand, and the original Chechens would come after them. <clears throat> so the Russian mafia as it developed was not guided by family loyalties but solely by transactions. How much, what for, what's in it for me, who for. This meant that they were unpredictable, fluid, and dangerous. And the third difference is, is that in contrast to the five families of America's Cosa Nostra, there were thousands of these organizations in Russia. By 1999, there were over 11,500 private security firms employing more than 800,000 people. Of these, almost 200,000 had licenses to carry arms. The Russian Interior Ministry has estimated that there were at least half as many again who were unregistered. Not surprisingly, this proliferation in arms translated into a proliferation in murders and assassinations. By 1995, thousands of murders were being committed throughout Russia every year, especially in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, and other major centers of commerce. The cost of taking out a rival in 1997, 1997 was $7,000 for a client without bodyguards and up to $15,000 for one with bodyguards, according to the Russian Interior Ministry. Paradoxically, if you were not involved in business or in the protection industry, you were much safer in Moscow than in most other major cities of the world. <clears throat> Sonsevo was one of the safest places in Russia, explained Alexander Mukhin, Moscow's most fastidious chronicler of organized crime groups, talking about the biggest organized crime group in Moscow, Sonsevo. You wouldn't get mugged there because that was the home base of the Sonsevo gang, and they were genuinely proud of their origins. The oligarchs and their rape of Russia's assets enjoy pride of place in the boom of the global shadow economy during the 1990s. Not only did they succeed in turning Russia upside down, their actions had a huge economic and social impact on countries throughout Western Europe, in the United States, in the Mediterranean, above all Cyprus and Israel, in the Middle East and Africa, and in the Far East, especially Japan. Unable even to claim that they were helping to police the transition <coughs> to capitalism, 
as protection rackets undoubtedly were, their overall influence has been more destructive than that of most of the Russian organized crime groups. But the oligarchs have survived the backlash rather better than the overtly criminal groups, at best with all their money intact and maintaining tolerable relations with President Putin. Even those who have fallen out with the president have proved adept at gaining political asylum elsewhere while retaining a lot of cash. Mikhail Karakovsky, the world's richest Russian before his 40th birthday, now languishes in jail, supping kasha, famously tasteless Russian porridge, and fish soup. President Putin went after him and Russia's largest oil company, Yukos, to warn off all oligarchs against political ambition they may harbor that could threaten Putin and his friends from the FSB, the KGB's successor. Kordakovsky is an important exception, but his fate proves the rule. And that rule confirms, confers immunity on the oligarchs in part because the scale of their operations allowed them to foster tremendous political power, particularly during Boris Yeltsin's presidency. But in part also because the commodities in which they deal, like aluminum, for example, are not usually associated with organized crime. The oligarchs and organized crime were intimately, if opaquely, linked. It's important to reiterate that from 92 to 99, the most abnormal circumstances prevailed in Russia and much of the former Soviet Union, whereby a distinction between legality and illegality, morality and immorality, barely existed. But had the rule of law prevailed at the time, then there is no question that the oligarchs' behavior would have landed them in prison well beyond the pale. Where are we now? The nexus linking crime, government, security services in particular, and businessmen is present as never before in many countries around the world. It feeds off one particularly rich carcass, the discrepancy in wealth between the developed and the developing world. Organized crime prospers in large part because globalization is not evolving on a level playing field. Unless the Western world is prepared to address the issue of global po poverty in a more concerted and systematic fashion than it has done hitherto, organized crime will continue to subvert and corrupt governments around the world, discouraging democracy, discouraging the arbitration of impartial institutions. For those who think you can face this challenge by throwing a few more cops onto the street or building up the fortresses, fortress walls of Europe and America still higher, I urge you to think again. Organized crime is driven not by evil people, but by rational economic actors. Thank you. And if I'm not much mistaken, it's uh, questions now, and I have to preface the questions by insisting that people have access to a microphone which is being organized in the middle. Does it work? Um, uh, if they want to um, ask a question. There you go. So, uh, anyone? So you mentioned a little bit about it, but what is the responsibility of the Western powers, in particular the United States, insofar as what happened in... Uh, in Russia, in particular, under Yeltsin and following that? Well, I think it's pretty considerable, really. Um, what can I say? <laughs> they, you know, I mean, the atmosphere, going back through, through the papers, which, I, which I've, I've done when I was looking into this, the, you know, the, the sense of euphoria and the sense that, you know, the, the, the shock therapy was for Russia, <clears throat> their way forward was uh, was very pervasive and and <clears throat> the the you know the absurd situation of the bailing out of of the ruble with uh, the IMF billions as uh, money as dollars were being loaded on planes out of out of Moscow and sent around the world into private bank accounts, and we are talking over a 10-year period of between two and $300 billion, um, <clears throat> meant that clearly people who were in charge of, uh, of developing policy towards Russia and economic policy, in particular in the West, were getting something monumenta monumentally wrong. And um, I mean, by that, I don't want to exonerate um, 
the Russians and the mistakes they made. You, it's always very easy to fall in the trap of, of uh, just blaming the, blaming the West, but, you know, I mean, the, the Russians are a mature people with intelligence to realize that uh, some things are right and, and some things are, are wrong, despite what I was saying about the economic circumstances, you know, making it very difficult to identify what is, what is legal and uh, what is uh, illegal. Um, <clears throat> But I do think that uh, this great larceny was going on in the name of privatization um, uh, through negligence on the part of the West in some cases, and in some other cases through you know, an ideological drive, um, uh, which has proved extremely damaging in the long run. Uh, there's, I mean, I, d I don't really want to go into it now, but the whole issue of privatization predates the, the, the Russian experience. And you actually see the encouragement of the privatization of state functions, the outsourcing of state functions in, in, in critical developing countries in the, in the late 70s, and, but particularly in the 1980s, which have led to equally uh, calamitous situations, the most egregious of which, in my opinion, is probably Nigeria. Um, but there are... Uh, and so the, the, the sort of urge towards privatization didn't coincide with the collapse of, of communism. A case had been built up for that uh, before it had happened, and it's, you know, it's turned out to be the wrong one, no question. I was curious if there's any evidence that those administering the um, protectorate in Bosnia and Kosovo if there's any evidence that they're involved with um, any of the organized crime or if they've received any kind of kickbacks or anything like that? Um, I don't think that, I don't think that, uh, <clears throat> well, in Bosnia there are, one, there are one or two examples. There are quite a few examples in Kosovo. A lot of those examples have been hushed up um, to do with... Uh, Contracts. I mean, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole issue of of, of of European interest in particular in <clears throat> in the Balkans during the 1990s when they go in and grab strategic uh, strategic industries from the Balkans as a kind of long term investment. But there was massive corruption by an Italian company which was in Albania with the backing of of the Italian government on the. Uh, uh, the supply of water to uh, to Tirana, um, and uh, that was hushed up uh, by the Italian government, you know, leaning on the Albanian government not to make it public. Um, massive corruption on the road building program in Albania, which involved uh, <clears throat> a very well established Greek company, and in Kosovo itself. Uh, there is a lot of evidence of corruption in which Western companies and some of the UN administrators are complicit in areas like telecommunications. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, what you don't have there is, is you don't have an investigative capacity of uh, either uh, of an independent judiciary system, because none exists in Kosovo, uh, or, of, or of the media um, on the whole. The media tends to be bought off. Those who are wealthy enough not to be bought off, i.e. the Western media, uh, have uh, completely lost interest in places like Kosovo, uh, except when it blows up sporadically. And uh, they certainly haven't got enough time and money and energy to devote into the investigation of something like corruption in the telecommunications uh, industry in, in, in Kosovo. But it does go on. I think Bosnia is, I mean, although there are high levels of corruption in Bosnia, Bosnia, I don't think that they, uh, they affect the international administration uh, quite, as, quite as much, largely because it's much, much smaller. Uh, uh, the room for local governance in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina is much greater than it is in Kosovo de facto, and I think that, that explains it in part. Do you think an independent Kosovo or uh, returning the Kosovo region to full Serbian control would be better in uh, stemming the, uh, the organized crime there? Um, <clears throat> It's more a question about the Balkans than organized crime. The organized crime tacked in on the end. Um, 
Uh, well, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a tricky one. My position my position on this is is I take a uh, a position which looks at the region and which <coughs> um, believes that the most important way to stabilize the region is to get uh, Serbia into the European Union as soon as possible. Uh, in order to facilitate that, um, I think that Serbia has to uh, deal with the reality that it's going to lose Kosovo, whether it likes it or not. And to be, you know, to be brutally practical about this, this has been signed off by all of the contact group, including Russia. Don't anyone ever fall into the trap and think that, that Russia will defend Serbia's interests out of a matter of principle. Have a look at what Russia and, and the remaining oligarchs are doing to Montenegro at the moment, and uh, <clears throat> you'll see that the greatest advocate of Montenegrin independence on in the international arena is Yuri Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow. And you may wish to investigate why that is so. <laughs> um, and so Russia has signed off on the independence of Kosovo. Um, the Serbian leadership, Kostunica and Tadic, Prime Minister and President, uh, oppose it in public, but they know full well and have accepted themselves in private that it's going to happen um, because there's very little that they can, they can do about it. Now, what irritates me about this situation is, is that the European Union does not offer Serbia sufficient uh, guarantees and uh, incentives uh, um, uh, to allow the present leadership in Serbia to explain to its electorate that it's going to lose Kosovo. Um, <clears throat> and that's the sort of key of the conundrum, along with the fact that the Albanians in Kosovo have to learn to start treating their Serbian minority properly, and that's equally important and, at the moment, equally unlikely to happen, in, in my estimation. Uh, until this constitutional dilemma is sorted out, then you have very retarded progress on the economy. And retarded progress on the economy is power to the elbow of corrupt influences and criminal influences. And so the key is not so much will the loss or the gain of Kosovo uh, lead to a reduction in organized crime. The key is constitutional clarity and stability uh, will lead ultimately to the reduction in these forces because of the prosperity and economic, uh, economic good that it brings. Um, may I um, follow up on one thing that I mentioned at the beginning that a number of past Miller comms have dealt with uh, issues of human rights, and and one of them was on criminal trafficking in prostitution. And I, I think you were um, referring um, to, to that in part when you were saying that just putting a few more policemen on the beat was not, was not the solution. Um, can you talk, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the cases that was made to us is that what really, that in dealing with um, criminal trafficking, uh, prostitution, what was really needed was a commitment to stopping it and, uh, and the law enforcement commitment. Can you expand on what I, I, I think is your argument that, that, that this is part of a much broader system that um, that merely um, increased law enforcement really isn't going to do much about? Um, yes, in some, in, in, in some respects. I mean, there is a law enforcement problem with the trafficking in women because it is not considered as serious an issue as trafficking in narcotics or trafficking in weapons, and particularly in trafficking in nuclear material. And so you'll see that whenever you talk to people at senior policy levels about these issues, they will tack on trafficking in women uh, at the end, even though the damage that is done on a human scale is much more immediate in, in trafficking in women. I have, uh, looking at this issue, I've spent uh, most time in, in Moldova and in Transnistria. 
um, <clears throat> where you have immensely high levels of uh, women being uh, women being trafficked, and uh, there are one or two really excellent organizations, NGOs, which are working with these women who've come up with statistics, and uh, it's very clear that levels of education, uh, levels of, uh, you know, geographic origin, levels of unemployment, uh, and uh, also rural as opposed to urban environments are absolutely critical in defining whether a woman is going to be, a young woman is going to be vulnerable to uh, trafficking or not. Now, even in the further north you went, when, 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 when uh, trafficking began in the late 80s and early 90s, and the focus of trafficked women was from Poland uh, Czechoslo and Czechoslovakia in particular uh, into Germany and other West European countries, uh, there was a relatively high level of women being trafficked who were fully conscious of what they were doing. Uh, they were being driven out by the poverty of the areas that they came from, <coughs> and they were often eating, uh, uh, feeding whole families, if not villages. The further south you got, the higher the level of coercion became, largely to my mind, because of two things. One was the war in Yugoslavia and the much greater need to generate profits in order to run the war in Yugoslavia. And the other was, in relative terms, the, much, uh, the, the impoverishment of the western areas of the former, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, and so there is a much lower level of women who are trafficked from, say, Moldova, who are where of what is going to happen to them. Um, there is still a notable level, something in the region of between 20 and 25% of women who understand that they're going to go into prostitution, but who have absolutely no idea that they're going to, be, they're going to spend the next six months to a year or two years of their life being raped 20 times a night. Um, but because there is a notional understanding that they are going to work abroad as uh, prostitutes, they are then, by the host country, they are dismissed. And the, the key thing which countries are refusing to do and which everyone ought to be shamed into doing is they uh, treat women who've been trafficked as illegal immigrants. So that as soon as they escape out of the bondage that they find themselves in, they are deported back to their original recruiters and, and traffickers. And, they're an, and it's only a small percentage who are able to access the services of these really terrific NGOs who stand at airports in, uh, in Chisinau uh, and Odessa and Kiev and scan the airport for women coming through and they have trained psychologists who recognize people who show symptoms of, of having suffered multiple abuse. Um, <clears throat> there is a, so there is a whole raft of things still to be done on the legislative level. But above all else, um, there needs to be a social shift. I went around for my research. I, followed the, the, I, I interviewed women both in, in Tel Aviv and in, uh, and in Chisinau because I was interested in the trafficking arrangements between Moldova and Israel because this, they, are, they are trafficked by groups uh, in Moldova, then into Odessa, then up from Odessa into, U into Moscow. From Mos Moscow, they're flown to Cairo. From Cairo, Egyptians hand them over to Egyptian Bedouins. The Egyptian Bedouins traffic them across the Israeli-Egyptian border into the Negev, where they're picked up by um, Israeli Bedouins, who then hand them over to Russians in Beersheba, and then uh, Russian uh, immigrants, this is, and then the Russian immigrants hand them over to the, the pimps in Tel Aviv who tend to be Israeli Israelis. So that these are women who have been, you know, this is how I want to stress about transnational organized crime uh, is able to liberate itself from the idea of you know, uh, national differences and, and, and national conflict because of the 
uh, relentless aspect of demand. And so well, the other thing I did was to spend an evening going from the various brothels in Tel Aviv, from those which service the, uh, service the immigrant workers, of whom there are now a lot in Israel because of the fact that the Palestinians no longer go in, uh, up to the kind of ones um, you know, who are there for the Israeli lower middle class, and then up to the, to the high class one, which a lot of American Jews, for example, frequent. I mean, I, I went into this one place and was astonished to see these three 18-year-olds from the east side of New York walk in and start negotiating with these, you know, kind of completely zombied uh, uh, Russian prostitutes about how much they'd, they'd pay. Uh, and this is a scene that you will see in London, in Dubai, in Tel Aviv, uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, um, wherever you go, these women are being trafficked and it is the demand and the social acceptability which allows this to happen, both on a policy level, because they're not dealing in narcotics or guns, and on a parochial level uh, down on the ground. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, all of our societies just have to look at ourselves and say, what is it that we're engaged in here? Andrei Ilarionov, President Putin's former economic advisor who left recently over, how shall we say, a difference in philosophy, has been traveling in the West trying to paint his picture of what he calls corporatist Russia, where the Russian government is trying to, you know, in many cases successfully reestablishing control over business for their own benefit. Do you agree with his analysis? And if so, what is that going to mean for the Russian crime families? Uh, I agree with some of his analysis, yes. And uh, not quite all of it, but with, with, with a lot of it. What I think that Putin has been doing is, is he's been getting the oligarchs under control. I mean, the, the Russian state, you know, the, the bear went into hibernation and woke up with a massive hangover and looked around it and said, who's taken all my honey? <clears throat> you know, and there were the Berezovskis and Khodorkovskis as well with honey dripping down their mouths and stuff like that. And they said, we want it back. And, uh, but, you know, by now Russia was a capitalist state and it had uh, complex relations with uh, uh, countries all over the world, economic relations, and it couldn't just sort of, uh, uh, you know, reimpose an entirely statist, statist model. And so it struck deals or not with the oligarchs. Um, the classic case is if you, if you compare Khodorkovsky on the one hand with Abramovich on the other hand. This is that the, the deal with Abramovich was uh, very simple. He had prophylactically started moving his money into the English premiership in the form of Chelsea. Um, <clears throat> but he still had a huge interest in Sidneft and he was the governor of Chukhotka province. And when Putin uh, revoked the process of the election of governors uh, of the provinces, he basically went to Abramovich and said, look, here's the deal. You can sell us Sibneft, because we're turning Gazprom into you know, the, the, the Leviathan. And you can get the cash, and you can do with it what you want. You can take it out of Russia. You can buy the entire Syria R or the Premier. It doesn't, we don't care. But you remain as governor of Chukhotka province, because Putin's sensible enough to know that Abramovich is a very, very popular figure there. Abramovich wanted to leave from the governorship. He wanted out. And Putin said, uh-uh, no, you stay there. And don't you dare say anything about me, and don't you dare show any political ambition. And so, you know, that was the deal. Fair enough. <clears throat> Gazprom is the key to what's been going on. and. You know, the, uh, uh, Gazprom was, was another kind of uh, rogue company, fantastically successful. Uh, in order to get the gas from uh, Turkmenistan over to Western Europe, you have to pay kickbacks all the way. And in the 1990s, and late 1990s in particular, three companies emerged, one after the other, called uh, Itera, ETG and then Rosukara Enego, which were the companies which managed 
the transport from Turkmenistan to Western Europe of the gas. And what this company was, um, was basically the manager of the kickbacks. Um, <clears throat> and Putin has not dismantled that system because although he is bringing back Gazprom into the state fold and transforming it, in my opinion, as the, the key instrument of, the, of Russian foreign policy, the military no longer can do it, and so Gazprom and the energy sector become the key thing, he is still skimming off billions. Now, where that money is going, uh, I don't know, but it's the, 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 the whole scam of the Rotokarenigo continues to this day, and I suspect, and there's entire speculation and off the record, that it's going to his friends uh, from St. Petersburg. Um, so, uh, yes, this is not like the Soviet state. Uh, because there is a significant private income which is being shared amongst the elite. It's just that the state, it seems to me, has much more control on how that hyper-wealth at the top uh, is being distributed. And of course, it is almost certainly being distributed better at the, at the bottom. The problem about organized crime, oligarchs, and these whole systems is there is no institutional control on them. And so you get somebody like Pablo Escobar in, in Medellin who would build churches and schools, you know, and be God in Medellin. But he would only build churches and schools when the mood took him. He didn't, you know, have an assessment of what the needs of the, uh, of the, the poor of Medellin were. Uh, and this is what happens everywhere is, is you develop systems of patronage which tend to funnel all the money up to the top and leave the majority of people just waiting for arbitrary crumbs to fall from the table. And I suspect that Putin's strategy has redressed that imbalance somewhat, but that it is uh, uh, equitable and that it is you know, transparent and so on and so forth, absolutely not. Gazprom remains one of the most untransparent companies in the world.